Hello everyone and welcome to the first Q&A of 2016. A lot of great questions were left on the last Q&A that we did. It was quite some time ago, but before we get to those, I first want to take a moment and let you all know what we can expect for this year to be released, because it's going to be quite a busy year. We have, of course, the Legion expansion set coming up and the Warcraft movie. There's a novel by Christy Golden, which is going to be a prequel to the Warcraft movie. The Illidan novel by William King, as well as Bonds of Brotherhood by Paul Cornell. Bonds of Brotherhood is going to be a graphic novel surrounding the events of Medivh's youth. And finally, there are the Warcraft Chronicles, which will talk about the early history of the Warcraft universe. That's not counting any short stories or other projects they haven't announced yet, but safe to say, I'm very excited about all the things still to come. That's future talk though, so while we wait, let's answer a few questions, starting with... Hey Noble, is there a story about Golmash Hellscream? Nope, there isn't really a story about Golmash Hellscream. Now Golmash, he was the father of Gromash Hellscream, which makes him the grandfather of Garrosh Hellscream. His death came in a glorious battle, crushed the death in the jaws of a hulking run. With the teeth digging deep into his flesh, Golmash still found the strength to raise Gorhal and stab the Gron's eye, bringing the beast down with him. When they fell, it was the Gron who died first, and this is explained in a quest during Wars Draenor, and this expansion is also the first mention of Golmash. Now those who die in brutal combat often enter the spirit world in unrest, so it was with Golmash, and we were put on the task of putting his spirit to rest by simply kicking the crap out of it. When Golmash died, the mighty weapon Gorhal was granted to his son, and although it's not 100% certain, it seems unlikely that Golmash was the chieftain of the Warsong clan. As described within the novel Rise of the Horde, the rumor was that Gromash actually killed the chieftain to claim the title of war chief, and since Golmash died a different death, it doesn't seem like he was the war chief. That's all the story we have on Golmash. Next question. Have you ever tried roleplaying? Has it ever been something you've considered? I get this question all the time and unfortunately I've never done any serious roleplaying. There's a big difference between telling a story and creating your own. I simply feel like I don't have the imagination to properly set up a good character. On top of that, the things that I've seen on the roleplaying forums are not that encouraging. I've seen a couple of posts from people which they're simply trying to discredit or criticize other people's storylines and that just baffles me to be honest. Why would you want to limit others in their creativity if someone wants to be Suzanne Windrunner, for example, enjoying the quiet life on the little farm? All the power to them, right? But it seems like some players out there, they're out to, you know, criticize other people and put them down. That's just my impression from a distance, though. I have no idea what it's actually like to play on a role-playing server and be part of that community. It does seem like a lot of fun when done with the right people. People send me their stories from time to time, which I read when I have the time for it, and the creativity that goes into it is just mind-blowing. I remember one storyline where someone was related to the green dragon flight with Ysira. There was, I believe, a rogue character who used poison and nature and all that. When I had the time to read it, I found it a lot of fun. Now for your question, have I ever tried role-playing? There was one stream where the chat room asked me if I could make like a role-playing story, invent a story for my character. I came up with a little thing, you know, on stream, what's on the top of my head. If you want to check it out, the link to that is in the description. Next question comes in from Harry Cooper. Hey Noble, smiley face, I'm confused about the dragons of Warcraft. I get that certain dragons belong to certain flights, but there are many more dragons out there. The stone dragons, the netherwing dragons, the storm and wind dragons, and even the proto dragons. Those types of dragons don't get talked about at all. Were the stone dragons made? If so, by who? Were all the dragons stone and did they get cursed by the curse of flesh at some point? Thanks Noble, sorry if I phrased this wrong. I think it's a great question, I've never really made a full list of the different dragons before, so I thought I'd take this opportunity to do it here in the Q&A. Now in the beginning, there were the proto-dragons in all kinds of colors, but one of them, known as Galagrond, he mutated into a massive beast that started to eat its own kind. Five proto-dragons of all different colors, they teamed up with the Tide Keeper Tear, and eventually, throughout the story of Dawn of the Espex, they brought down Galagrond. With that, the proto-drakes were offered the job of safeguarding the five essential aspects that have helped mold the world of Azeroth and would continue to do so. The five future aspects agreed to take up that charge and with the blessing of the titans, they were the first to be transformed into dragons. You had Nelfarian for the black dragon flight, he was the aspect of earth and would later be corrupted by the old gods and known as Deathwing. Melagos for the blue dragon flight, aspect of magic, he would go mad because of Deathwing's betrayal, he would regain his sanity and he would start a war against the world to which we 
Dupuy took him out in the Nexus and he was replaced by Melagos. Alex Raza for the Red Dragonflight, the Aspect of Life. Yasira for the Green Dragonflight, the Aspect of Nature. And finally Nosdormu for the Bronze Dragonflight, the Aspect of Time. These five flights are the origin, but more Dragonflights would show up in the future. So far we've seen the following. There was the Chromatic Dragonflight. These were created by Nefarian, the son of Deathwing, in an attempt to combine the different colors of the original flights into one. The Infinite Dragonflight, a corrupted version of the Bronze Dragonflight in a time where the Bronze Dragon aspect Nosdormu, he was tricked by the old gods to abuse his powers and subvert his mortality. Unfortunately, time travel is a little bit iffy and it's up for speculation if we change the future in the Cataclysm or if Nosdormu will still become corrupted and be known as Moruzan. Then there is the Netherwing Dragonflight. When Deathwing teamed up with Teron Gorfiend and the Horde, he had them transport some of his Black Dragon Axe to Draenor in exchange for his help. When Ner'zhul unleashed his spell and opened up portals all over the planet, it became very unstable, right? We talked about this during the story of the Lich King, during the story of Ner'zhul. This transformed Draenor into Outland as we know it today. The Black Dragon Axe, they were on the planet. They were changed by the energies released, turning them into Netherwing Dragons. The Plagued Dragonflight, the Cult of the Damned, experimented with Black Dragon Eggs taken from the Burning Steps as they tried to create undead dragons. I couldn't find out if they succeeded with anything besides Plagued Whelps, but there is the description which says that Kelfuzad, he once nurtured a whelp to adulthood by feeding it only the finest liquefied remains. We have seen adult undead dragons of course, but those were not hatched from eggs, those were raised from the dead. The Twilight Dragonflight, created by Deathwing's consort Sinfaria. She combined the powers of the Nether Dragons as well as two powerful artifacts. The shards of the Demon Soul and Bellicose's Bane were used to perform experiments on stolen dragon eggs from various different flights. Her efforts created unstable dragons, which were taken out, but Deathwing wasn't ready to give up so easily. Even though Sinfaria believed that she was doing this out of her own free will, it was actually Deathwing whispering to his consort. He took their plans further, and we've seen several powerful Twilight Dragons pop up during Wrath of the Lich King and the Cataclysm, for example. Now, with the war against Deathwing behind us, the Twilight Dragon flight is nearly extinct. These are the major dragonflies that I could find. Now there are a few different dragons that pop up here and there, but most of them don't have that much of a story or background to talk about. You did ask specifically about the stone drakes and unfortunately their origin is unknown. During the Ask Creative Development Round 2, they asked a similar question to which Blizzard said, Bram Bronzebeard recently uncovered evidence by a report from adventurers in Deep Home that proto-dragons and dragons may have origins in these and other elemental drakes. The inhabitants of Deepholm, the Skywall, the Firelands and the Abyssal Maw are less than talkative on these matters however and most of them were not around when the elemental prisons were created. So it's possible that the proto-dragons that were transformed into dragons by the titans that they originate from the different elemental dragons that we've seen like the stone and the storm dragons. Perhaps like the elements themselves they simply popped up into existence but we don't know for sure. Next question. Is there any in-game reason for Worgen Death Knights, being as in the undead questing zones we learn that Worgen can't become Forsaken and Death Knights are risen the same way as the new Forsaken? Now I had to do a fair bit of research for this question and here's what I found. First, let's talk about the difference between being raised as a Forsaken and being raised as a Death Knight. This is taken from Ask Creative Development Round 2. Why are humans who drink the blood of Worgen unable to be raised as Forsaken? Not only are the Valkyr less powerful than the Lich King when it comes to raising the undead, but the Worgen curse also makes raising them into undeath far more difficult than it is for normal humans. The Worgen curse has roots in both the Emerald Dream through the Wolf Ancient Goldrin and the holy power of the goddess Alun. In addition, those Worgen who imbibe the waters of Taldoren through the ritual they undergo to maintain balance between the Worgen curse and their humanity have a further resistance to the corruption of undeath. So that's why the Worgen have a stronger immunity to the powers used by the Valkyr and it shows that there's a difference between being raised by the Valkyr and being raised by the Lich King. There's a great post on the forums made by Koronif in which he or she explains the details behind role playing as a Worgen Death Knight. I'll link that post in the description down below if you want to check it out. Now the main thing to keep in mind is that the Worgen Death Knights, they were not part of the Worgen epidemic within Gilneas and the whole Forsaken invasion as you see it in the Worgen starting zone. Instead, they were servants of Arugal as described in the quest a special surprise. Come to finish the job, have you? You look me in the eyes when... Name? 
Name, I'd recognize that face anywhere. What? What has it done to you, Name? You don't remember me. We were both servants of Arugal back in Silverpine Forest. We put up with his merciless torture for ages. It was you who saved me on that fateful night when we escaped Shadowfan Keep. Without you, I would have died. You, the most noble worgen I ever knew. What have they done to you, Name? How could this have happened? Remember the worgen you once were, brother or sister. You were our savior. Fight this. Listen to me, Name. You must fight against the Lich King's control. He is a monster that wants to see this world, our world, in ruin. Don't let him use you to accomplish his goals. You were once a hero, and you can't be again. Fight, damn you. Fight his control. There's no more time for me. I'm done for. Finish me off. Do it, or they'll kill us both. Remember Gilneas, our beloved home. This world is worth saving. Do with name, put me out of my misery. Which leaves the question, how can you control the worgen spirit inside of you without going through the ritual that the Gilnean worgen go through? This was also asked during the Ask Creative Development Round 3, to which they said, When the player death knights are pressed into the service of the Lich King, their minds are flooded with his indomitable will. The mind of a worgen who has not undergone the purification ritual beneath Taldoren is in a state of constant battle between the wild animal instincts of the curse and the rational mind of a human. Almost invariably, the curse overwhelms the human mind and renders the worgen little more than a ravenous beast. With the addition of the Lich King's control, however, the instincts of the curse are shattered by his power, leaving the logical human mind in the service of the scourge. And with the Lich King's will removed, as was the case with the Knights of the Ebon Blade at Light's Hope Chapel, only the human portions of the mind remain, giving the now free undead worgen control over its destiny. Like I said, it's a little bit complicated to put all the pieces together. Check out the amazing role-playing guide linked in the description and I'm sure that you'll find all the information that you need. Which brings us to the final question of this Q&A and we're staying with the Death Knight theme. Hello Noble87, love the vids. I have a question about the DK because my main character is DK. What purpose do the DK have now after the death of Arthas? Are they completely free at their own will or do they serve Daria Mograine? Love the vids, big smiley face. The main problem with the Death Knight storyline is that the story was introduced and resolved within one expansion. During Wrath of the Lich King, we see Darian Mograine and a bunch of the other Death Knights, they step away from the Lich King to form the organization known as the Knights of the Ebon Blade. Together with the Argent Crusade, they worked on conquering Northrend, taking down Arthas, and with the mission done, they kinda seemed to vanish. For the longest of time, we didn't hear much from the Death Knights. Now there was a questline during the Cataclysm. This was the battle for Enderhal. They revamped some of the older quests during the Cataclysm, and at the battle, we saw Fasarian, together with Coltara, trying to claim the area for either the Alliance or the Hordes. Their friendship was seen as a weakness by Sylvanas, who decided to capture Coltara and send him to the Under city, but that storyline seems to be forgotten. It does show that these two Death Knights are working for either the Alliance or the Horde, so it's not unreasonable to think that most Death Knights are serving the respective factions. Now during Warlords of Draenor, we finally saw High Lord Darian Mograine again, who showed up at the Lunafall Inn or the Frostwall Tavern. Though the Lich King has been defeated, we are no closer to unlocking the secrets of the Frozen Throne than we were when jousting pointlessly at the Argent Tournament. Bova remains resigned to his fate. Perhaps there is something here though that can aid us. Nerzul was not always the Lich King, you know. Once he was a mere orc dabbling in dark powers beyond his comprehension. Find whatever you can of his early studies and we may have our answers. From this questline, it seems like Darian is looking for some way to get Bolvar out of his fate as being the Lich King. A lot of people hope that this story would be continued, but Legion shows a different tale. I've saved this question for the end on purpose, for those that don't want any Legion spoilers. If you are avoiding these spoilers, then this would be the time to turn off the video. And let me just say thank you very much for watching. For those that do want the spoilers, in Legion, we'll find out that the Lich King, he's an unexpected ally in the war against the Legion. The Knights of the Ebon Blade are willing to serve as the Lich King's arm, as long as the Scourge is contained to Northrend. In return for their assistance, the Lich King has offered to assist in obtaining powerful weapons for the strongest of their knights. Weapons powerful enough to end the Legion once and for all, and naturally, we are the strongest knights. As Echorus moves next to Ice Crown, heroes of the Alliance and Horde go in to obtain the Shards of Frostmourne and forge their artifacts. They even receive the blessing of the Lich King, and Darian proclaims that the Knights of the Ebon Blade will all bow down to us as they once did to him. From this, I'd say that the 
the Death Knights, they are working together with the Lich King for the greater good, but they still have their own will. They decide who they want to serve, and most of them, they either serve where the Ebon Blade goes, or they serve either the Alliance or the Horde. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the end of the first Q&A for 2016. Thank you all so much for sending in all these questions. If you have more, leave them in the comments down below, and I might use them in the next video. A link to a list of questions that I've answered in the past can be found in the description. And as always, thank you very much for watching, everyone. Subscribe if you like my videos, leave a like if you enjoyed this one, and until next time, guys, see ya!